Hey guys, it's Nick. Welcome to another episode of TMI 365 where I demystify Microsoft solutions for the MSP space. In today's video, I'm going to be doing my first ever tech review and it's going to be on Microsoft Teams webinars. This is a functionality and feature that recently came out within the past month or so here from Microsoft, but it is something that I feel like is going to be widely adopted in the future. So I just wanted to do a demo on all the features functionality and some of the caveats that I found through testing, ultimately so that you guys can be a little bit more proactive with the questions you might get from your end users. Before I get into today's video though, if you do want to see more content around Microsoft 365 and the MSP space, be sure to subscribe. Okay, so I'm here within Teams client environment here with a user that has Microsoft 365 Business Premium licensing. And right off the bat, there's a little bit of a pain point here, which is related to the licensing model. In all the documentation, tutorial videos, things like that, they always have you come over here to this new meeting section. There's a drop down usually here, which includes the ability to schedule a live event, to schedule a webinar, or to just schedule a meeting in general. And that's not available here. So I racked my head around this for a while and figured out that at the end of the day, it's really related to your licensing model. The licenses, as you'll see here on the screen, relate to the enterprise level plans in which you get the capability to schedule webinars, it includes the A level plans, A3, A5 for education, and it includes standard and premium in the business SKUs to, in order to schedule these. But the main thing here is that this drop down link is never going to show with the business plans. There's a couple other features that I'll mention that aren't available with the business plans versus the enterprise plans. But that's one right off the bat that was kind of confusing to me. Let's pop into another user's environment here who actually does have enterprise level licensing so you can see that. Okay, so I'm here and this person has an E3 license and as you can see, there's this drop down menu and it has all the available settings here. So right off the bat again, this is a bit of a problem from an end user experience standpoint. You can still create a webinar, which I'll show here in a second, but it's just not as intuitive as being able to click this and click into the webinar functionality. So now let's pop back into the other tenant with business licensing as most of you will have that in your customer environments and walk through actually setting up that webinar. So back over here in the business tenant, we can click on new meeting to actually schedule this new meeting. The other confusing part in order to get this going for the functionality that you get if you were to just click on that webinar button in the E3 tenant is looking at this required registration. By default, this is going to be grayed out for everyone, which is another question you might get from your end users. Why is that grayed out? Why can't I send it to people outside of this organization? This really comes down to a Teams admin setting that you have for live settings. In the Teams admin center, you can configure this and change this to everyone. It takes about 30 minutes to propagate after you change that setting, but then they'll have this availability here. From a security standpoint, there's not a ton of concern there because it's not really affecting your sharing settings outside of just live events like this Teams webinar event. So in here, you could select this, and when you do so, this is when it pulls up this uh, attendees for this webinar uh, banner here, and that is what you see by default when you go and you click on the webinar button in the other view from an enterprise level perspective. The next thing that's confusing here, really, from a user experience standpoint, is you have this ability to configure here, but you see also this registration form. And from here, this is where you see, like, why am I putting in duplicate entries for both the title and things like that in the description, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. The basic concept here is this is basically what you're going to be sending to or sending to your presenters. So you're establishing who is going to be presenting in this. You could ask external presenters if you wanted to here, it'll invite them, or you could add optional presenters here. This is the main difference though. It's looking at the time in which you're scheduling this as a, as a calendar event. So you may wanna say, I wanna schedule this 15 or 30 minutes earlier than I actually have the webinar starting so that we can come on, we can do our voice checks or our presentation checks before the actual attendees start popping in and we admit them into that session. That's the other thing that you can control here, which I'll show you here in a few minutes. You could add you know, the description here that'll be for the presenters and things like that as well too, if you really wanted to. But then back in the registration form, you can add the particular information for what they'll see on that landing page where they actually register and what they're gonna put into their calendar invite. So we're gonna say that this is a webinar to learn more about Migration Wiz. 
On the right hand side here, you can add your custom registration events like adding fields. And Microsoft by default gives you a lot of the options here that you can add, you know, just customize so that you don't have to add that yourself. You can make them required fields if you really wanted to for submission. And then you can add custom questions as well too, as such as free form text or choices as well. So you could say something like, what migration tools have you used in the past? And you could start adding options here like 0365 or Skykick. And so that gives you the flexibility to do that. And you can also add speakers here as well and a little bit of a bio on them. So I could say migration Okage. So that's, that's all things that you can do from here. You can also upload an image and that, that will be available for them uh, to see this particular event as well. When you upload this image, you can scale it or crop it here, but I'm gonna leave it how it is right now and click on done. That'll be available for them to see as well too in the actual invite that you send out to them. When you're done, you can click on save and this is a message you might see if your event time is, is earlier than the event time that we wanna have there. So you just gotta move it out into the future. So we'll click on save. And from here, you can copy this registration link and you wanna make sure, like it's saying here, to send the invite to presenters because I actually haven't done that in the other window here. This registration link though is what you can send via email, via social, you know, just to get people having awareness on that, you can post it up on LinkedIn. You could have it um, just in a regular email message to individual users or distro lists or things like that who you want to come in there. So the breadth of which you can share this from this page is very limited to just copying this link and, and sending it out. We're basically done with this though here. We can exit out of it and we can go ahead and send this particular information to our presenters and then that will create this calendar event on my calendar as well. And from here, we can go ahead and go in and the last piece that isn't available right out of the gate, which is kind of confusing as well, that should be part of the onboarding setup process, I feel like, which is the options or settings that they have for the meeting invite. So within here, you can click on this page and it'll open up this window in which we can configure the particular meeting settings. On the meeting settings page here, you can choose for everyone to be able to bypass the lobby, or you could say that only your organization gets to, or people I invite gets to bypass that, or only yourself. So this is saying like they check in and they wait for you to be admitted. The consideration that I would have there is after you start the meeting, it gets really annoying or to start admitting more people into the session, especially if you're presenting, it's really disruptive if somebody's coming in late or something like that. So you may wanna say that you know you lock this down or you let everybody just come in unimpeded if you really wanted to do it that way as well. Um, you could announce when callers join or leave and that is something that's gonna be popping up both in the chat session as well as in the, the video session as well. You could choose a specific people who can present as in everybody, people in the organization guess, specific people, which is basically saying that I can choose a person as the presenter to say, yep, this guy can present as well too. And then you can choose to have this option available where they can uh, allow them to enable their mic or the camera, or you could have this off by default um, so that nobody can do that as well too. And then for the chat settings, in meeting only means that as soon as the meeting ends, Everybody uh, who is not the organizer loses access to the chat, or if you say enabled, they'll have continuous access to that even after the meeting ends uh, versus disabled, which is saying that they don't have any chat capabilities whatsoever. Reactions is just your basic clap, smile, heart, whatever, um, throughout the, the actual session itself. So all of those are things that you can configure as well too as part of this uh, additional rollout. Let's pop into now and, and see an actual end user experience through getting the invite through email. Okay, so I'm here and I'm in a third party who's gotten this link in an email. I'm gonna go ahead and click on that. And they're gonna get my registration page that we just created there. And I'm gonna go ahead and add my information. I'm gonna say I've used Skykick in the past. Then we'll go ahead and click on register now. I'll get this acceptance and then it'll say that we sent a confirmation email to you here as well. So if I go back into my emails, I'll see this come through here in just a second. Okay, so I've got it here. I can quickly add it to my calendar 
and that'll be scheduled so I can pop into that webinar uh, when it's con being conducted. So that's the the whole end user experience there from, from that perspective and seeing that through email. The other cool part before you actually conduct this webinar is that it has registration details which will be updated. So it pumps out a CSV file for you, but you can see who's actually registered for the event and the attendee list before it's actually conducted. So all that works really well from right from here. Now let's go into the actual interaction in the meeting and see what that looks like as well here too. So let me go ahead and join. Even though this is not when it's scheduled, I'm just going to go ahead and join so that we can see the little bit of the end user interaction and what that actually looks like. So I'm here within this environment and I'm waiting for other people to join here now as well. And so if I pop in there and I join also as this particular person that I sent that invite out to, I'm going to go ahead and continue here. And because in this particular case, I set the meeting invite settings to make sure that they check in, I'm going to get prompted here for them to uh, let me into the meeting. So it's saying, hey, this guy's waiting. Let me go ahead and let him in. So I'll go ahead and admit him here. Okay, and so within the environment itself, not extensive here. I'm not going to have a ton of attendees, obviously, just for the sake of the demo. But essentially here, when you have your attendee menu, you get to go ahead and allow certain things like allowing your mic or allowing the camera of this particular user. You could also spotlight that user so that they're uniquely shown on the screen. The screen's a little bit bigger when you do that, and you can also make them a presenter as well too. And then lastly, you could remove them from the meeting if you really wanted to because you, you just have that flexibility to do so. The big things here is that the spotlight capability and the ability to use the breakout room functionality is only available in the client version. So if you're on the web browser and you're not seeing that, that would be the reason. That might be another help desk call you might get from one of your end users. You can go ahead and you can start the recording as well from this um, environment. Just take note that that is going to go to this person's personal OneDrive and nobody will have access to that after the meeting ends. So you have to go in there yourself and uniquely share it out with all the attendees afterwards if you really wanted to do that in, in that particular fashion. So those are the basic settings here. You can, you know, present, you can do the interact. People can have their interactions as, as they normally would within a team channel, and you can share just as you normally would with any, any team's environment itself. So all those are the particular settings and, and, and uniqueness of looking at what you have flexibility to do as a presenter and all the attendees here within the meeting. Whenever you're done, you could leave the meeting if you are one of the presenters and you just are leaving yourself. Or as a presenter, you can end the meeting for all, and it will close out the session for you. And that's when it would start generating the recording if you have it. The final pieces here are related to the attendee list. So this is another limitation between the business plan and the standard plan. If you have the business plan, you're just going to see this in the sense of having this as a CSV you could download. So it'll have this here, the attendance report for you which is cool because you can actually see the duration of how long the user stayed in the meeting, which is a cool feature, I like that. Um, but if you do not have the enterprise level plans, you don't have this attendance report or attendance tab up at the top of the screen, where you can visually use, utilize the just interface you're in now to see all that information versus having to download a CSV. It's not a big deal, it's just weird that they separated out the certain features like that um, within this environment. So that's everything I wanted to showcase for you guys in this demo. All right, thanks for watching that demo. To wrap up here, I wanted to go through some of the FAQs you might want to understand and know a little bit better for the service itself so you have the best information, most information possible leaving this video. First and foremost, I feel like some of you may be asking, what is the difference between Microsoft Live Events and Microsoft Webinars? What is the main functionality that I'm getting one or the other? There's a lot of similarities here, but the main difference I would say is, number one, the delivery method. Live events are made for broadcast and don't include a lot of interaction versus a webinar which includes the capabilities that you saw throughout this demo for more interaction, like giving the people the ability to share their camera or share their screen, make them a presenter, spotlight them in the video, have breakout rooms. All of that functionality is not available within a live event. Number two, the live events do not have a concept of a registration page. 
It is a link that you send to your users and you send them out a calendar invite. They just simply click on that and they're in the live session. That's all. There's not an actual registration page for them to go to, see more about the event, input questions or answer your questions that you presented on there. There's nothing like that in, in that concept as well. The third consideration is just licensing in general. With the business plans, you do not get the live event capability, but you do get the webinar capability like we saw here today. So those are three main concepts that I think you should know uh, when thinking about the differences between the two. The other last pieces here, the business plan is also limited to 300 members being able to participate within the meeting. After that, it caps out and everybody else who joins subsequently is in a view only state, meaning they can't chat, meaning they can't screen share or talk or anything like that. They're only there to view the event itself. So you just got to keep that in mind. With the enterprise level plans, it's a thousand person cap and then they move it into 20,000 view only attendees afterwards. So that's very important to know um, just when you're rolling this out and, and educating your end users on that functionality as well. So that's everything I wanted to finalize this video off with. I hope you found it was helpful. And lastly here, as far as my stamp for the review, I want to give Microsoft Teams webinars a 6 out of 10. I felt like there was a lot of limitations and confusion around the licensing model. I felt like it was somewhat confusing setting up the webinar events. But overall, I like the registration page and I like the interaction that you get while you're in the Teams event itself. Uh, during during the actual session. So thanks guys for watching again If you want to see more content around Microsoft 365 and the MSP space be sure to click on that subscribe button below. Thanks